Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22. Bibles, apps, whatever you read on. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one out of the back of the pew, and feel free to take that home with you. We want everybody here to have a Bible, to have God's Word, and be able to read it at home and study it. Now, as I open up this morning, I'm going to ask you a question. What is... Your favorite meal, and I'm not talking about breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I'm talking about what's that dinner that you just love to go get or that meal that someone in your family fixes that you just look forward to or or maybe that holiday that you just really enjoy and look forward to year in and year out. What's that? What's your favorite? Tacos. (laughs) Spoken like a true Texan. I mean, uh, but... uh, When I talked to the staff about this, you know, in developing this sermon, I asked around and Chad said Thanksgiving, which I would guess that if I asked uh, amongst you, Thanksgiving would probably be like number one or number two. Um, Chet, Pastor Chet said that his favorite was the 4th of July because, I mean, think about it, it's Chet. Any animal that's grilled outside, that makes him happy. Um, So... But when I was talking to everybody about this, I told them my favorite all-time meal is pancakes. And, and, you know, pancakes aren't your typical adult favorite meal kind of thing. Most guys are like, oh, a burger, pizza, a steak, or whatever. But mine are pancakes, and there's actually uh, a reason for the the way that I enjoy pancakes. And it it goes back to my childhood. When I was born, uh, I was born with a birth defect, and that birth defect... Uh, actually caused me to have a very restricted diet. And so growing up, I could not eat any form of sugar, including what's found in fruit. Um, So no sugar. I was not allowed to eat any type of grain. So no wheat, no barley, even rice, uh, oats. I I, I couldn't eat anything that grew on a stalk, basically. Um, I couldn't eat dairy, and I couldn't even eat potatoes. And so growing up, I didn't get to eat a lot of the foods that, you know, my cousins and my friends at school got to eat. I basically ate meat and some vegetables, and that was it. So think about Thanksgiving for a minute. What could I eat at Thanksgiving? Turkey. That was it. And now, as a grown-up, you know, my favorite part about Thanksgiving is I eat until I can't see straight, eat a little of everything until I can't see straight, then I eat just a little bit more, And then I go pass out watching a football game. And then the rest of the day, the only thing I eat is pie. That's my Thanksgiving. Um, At Christmas in my family, we have a longstanding tradition uh, when when I go home is we uh, we go and get a bunch of tamales and we fix a chili sauce to go with them. And my grandma and my aunts uh, would make homemade rolls and homemade cinnamon rolls. I never got to eat any of it. Ever, because none of that was within my diet restrictions. And so my mom and my grandma would actually make me a side meal that was just for me, and it was never as good as what I watched my cousins and my aunts and uncles eating. And so I didn't grow up in one of those situations where I enjoyed the holidays. Those weren't the days that I looked forward to. But I had a grandfather who would... Uh, He traveled a lot for work, and so if he had uh, a traveling job on Saturdays, he would call my mom up the week before and say, hey, can Chad come with me? My mom usually said yes. So Friday, I would stay the night at granddad's house, which as a four-year-old boy, that's big in and of itself. So I'd stay the night on Friday night with granddad, and on Saturday morning around 4 or 5 a.m., we would hop in granddad's work truck and head to whatever podunk town in the Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, Kansas, that he had his job at that day. But around 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, whatever little small town we were going through at that time, we would stop at the local diner, you know, good comfort food type place uh, in some small town. And my granddad would let me order a full stack of pancakes with all the butter and syrup that I could eat, a glass of orange juice, and a glass of cold milk. Pretty much nothing on that meal that I was allowed to eat. But it was heavenly to me. Because it was everything that I wanted to eat, but was not allowed to eat outside of this situation. And so I, as a four-year-old boy, could scarf down three full-size pancakes, a glass of OJ, and a glass of milk with no problem. 
because I loved it. I, I absolutely loved that food. And so I would come home from spending the day with my granddad sick as a dog and smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> and when granddad would call the next week, I would beg my mom to let me go. I would beg her to let me go with him that next Saturday, and I would come back sick, smiling ear to ear, begging to go again. It was something about that meal, obviously, we know what it is, but something about that meal is memorable, though, because to this day, I still have a very fond memory of pancakes. Now, today in Luke 22, we're talking about Jesus' last meal. But before we get there, we need to get the background story. We need to get the, what happened in history to understand what's happening with Jesus in Luke 22. So before we dive into that, let's talk about the past. That's your first blank, the past. Let's talk about the past so that we can understand what's happening in Jesus' uh, Luke 22 passage. So Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He has spent the week teaching and preaching and performing miracles and pretty much just blowing the minds of everybody in Jerusalem all week long. It is now Thursday of that week. And Thursday of this particular year was the day of Passover. Now we need to understand what the Passover is in order to understand Luke 22. So back up to Exodus chapters 1 through 12. In Exodus 1 through 12, we find the account of the Israelites being in slavery in Egypt. Uh, there's millions of them. They've been living in Egypt for 400 some odd years. And now they're being oppressed and they've been forced into slave labor. And they cry out to God and ask for God to set them free. And so God brings Moses along and tells Moses, you're going to go into Egypt. You're going to set my people free. And so Moses goes, he talks to Pharaoh, Pharaoh laughs in his face. Why would I give up six million people who are free labor? You're an idiot, I'm not going to do that. And so God, to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, God sends ten plagues on the land of Egypt. You get to Exodus chapter 12, nine of the plagues have happened, and the tenth plague is about to take place. And God tells the people of Israel, the tenth plague is coming, and in order to protect yourselves from this last plague, you have to do something. And he lays out very specific instructions on doing a last meal before they leave the land of Egypt. And basically, it boils down to they had to go out and buy an unblemished lamb for their entire family. One lamb for the family. They had to slaughter it and take the blood and cover the doorposts of their house in the blood of the lamb. And then they were supposed to take the lamb in and they had very specific instructions on how it was to be cooked and how it was to be eaten and how it was to be distributed. And then they were supposed to get ready and to, to leave Egypt. But before chapter 12 ends, God tells the people... And not only are you supposed to do this today, but you're going to do this for every year on this same day of the month from now on. This will be a celebration meal, and you'll follow these instructions to the letter to remember that I delivered you out of slavery in Egypt. And so the Passover is like the 4th of July on steroids to the Israelites. It's a big deal. People spent thousands of dollars every single year to celebrate the Passover. And if you didn't celebrate the Passover, you weren't a good Jew. You weren't a good Israelite if you didn't practice this celebration every single year. That's what's happening right here in Luke 22. They're about to celebrate the Passover. Now, a quick side note that's really cool is the Passover, even though it was established hundreds of years before Jesus, Every element of the Passover, every bit of instruction about how the Passover was to be done and prepared and and executed, everything pointed to a Messiah that would come hundreds of years later. I mean, think about it. How many of you have ever heard Jesus called the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain? That's Revelation. And when, when John wrote that passage and called Jesus the, la- the lamb that was slain, that the blood of the lamb was slain for you, every Jew that read that immediately went, he's the Passover lamb. 
he is the lamb. Back then, it was a national deliverance. Today, it's a personal deliverance. And every Jewish person, every Israelite, made an immediate connection with that name because of the history that they had coming out of the land of Egypt and the celebration of the Passover. So that's the past, okay? You with me so far? Now let's talk about the present. What's happening right now? I told you that Jesus has come in. It's now Thursday of his last week before he is crucified. And he is going up to celebrate the Passover. So look at your Bibles in Luke 22. We're going to start in verse 7. Luke 22, verse 7. And it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now stop there for just a second. Jesus says, we're about to take the Passover. I have earnestly longed to eat this Passover meal with you because I'm not going to eat it again until it is fulfilled. He's basically making a statement to his disciples, this Passover meal that you've been eating your entire life every year at this time is about me, and I'm about to fulfill it tomorrow night. He is coming right out and saying, I am the sacrificial lamb. He is fulfilling this whole meal. So pick back up in verse 17. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this, divide it amongst yourselves, For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This right here, This passage we just read is the first Lord's Supper. I don't know what your background is. There's many names for this. You may have called it Holy Communion. You may have grown up being taught that it was called uh, Eucharist. Whatever the name, we're talking about the last meal that Jesus took and commanded us to do the same to remember him. Now, the Lord's Supper, especially here in Luke 22, was very personal to Jesus. This was an intimate moment to him, and it needs to be personal to us as well, because think about it. He's taking the Passover, which was a celebration of national deliverance for the Israelite people out of the slavery that they were in in Egypt. He's taking that meal of remembrance, and he's now turning it into a remembrance of the day each one of us personally were set free from the slavery that we were under in our sin. And so he is transforming this from a celebration of national deliverance to a celebration of personal deliverance. So this should be very personal to each and every one of us because we're not celebrating him setting the United States of America free. We're celebrating him setting us free as individuals. And so it should be personal, and it was personal for Jesus. If you look in verse 15, he tells his disciples, I have earnestly longed to take this Passover meal with you. He wanted to spend time with his disciples before he was to go and be arrested and crucified. This was a big moment in Jesus' life. And he tells them to do this as a way to remember him. It's a moment where we can sit down and eat a piece of bread and drink a tiny cup of juice and remember Jesus Christ and literally 
spend time with him. I can tell you right now, every time that I eat pancakes, I think about my granddad. It doesn't matter even if I'm at McDonald's eating their crappy pancakes. I think about my granddad when I eat pancakes. And let me tell you one of the reasons why. Growing up, some of the circumstances in my life, I didn't trust adults. Uh, because of some of the things that had happened to me, my mom tells me stories of I'd be playing in a room and an adult, an adult would walk in and I would stop what I was doing and go cower in a corner because I did not trust grown-ups. But when my grandfather walked in the room, I ran to him. He was one of the only adults in my life that I had any trust for or any love for. And guys, that's exactly what we're doing here we are remembering someone that has sacrificed everything for us. Someone that has done things for us that no other person could do. And when we approach this meal, we need to think about what Jesus has personally done in our lives. It needs to be that moment where you can sit with Jesus and thank him for the relationship you can have with him. You know, if I had the opportunity to sit and eat pancakes with my granddad again, I would thank him. Because I'm the man I am today because of what he did in my life, because of who he was. And I do the same thing when I take communion. When I sit down and take the Lord's Supper, I thank God for who he has made me and what he has done and what he has delivered me from. It is intimate and it is personal. And so that's what we're doing today. So we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. And you think I'm going to tell you the next blank is the future. It's not. Now we need to talk about the practice. The practice. See what I did there with the three Ps? Past. <laughs> okay. Um, we need to talk about the practice. In other words, we... We understand what's going on here, but we need to understand what to believe about the Lord's Supper and why we do it and who can do it and, and all those different things. So, so let me tackle these one at a time. The first question that has to be answered is who can celebrate the Lord's Supper today? And that's very simple. Jesus makes it super easy for us. Jesus says, if you're a follower of me, you can take the Lord's Supper if you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, you're invited to come and participate in the Lord's Supper today. It's that simple. I don't care what your past membership is. I don't care what your history with the church is. I don't care if you've never been to a church until you came to Calvary and you're not a member here. None of that matters. All that matters is that you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ now. If you have that, you're welcome. You are invited to come and take the Lord's Supper with us. So that answers the who. Now we got to answer the what. What do we believe about this? Because growing up in church, um, you may have been taught some crazy things about it that you're not clear on, that you may not fully understand. I mean, every church and denomination kind of has their own idea of what happens when we take the Lord's Supper. And so let me kind of give you the four major beliefs of what churches believe about what happens in the Lord's Supper. The first one, and sorry, I'm going to throw out some words that you probably won't be able to spell. Don't worry, there's not a test or anything. You're, just stay with me. The first belief is called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, big word, don't worry about it. Basically, it means that that belief states that when you take the bread and you take the cup and you eat them, the bread and the juice literally, physically becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Literally, in a physical sense, it literally, did I say literally, becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus. Now, some of you are going, that's creepy, and I'm kind of with you on that. So, there's another one, and the next one is called consubstantiation. And consubstantiation is what Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Revolution and uh, Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, Lutheran, all those different churches that aren't either Catholic or Greek Orthodox, we come from his one act of starting this Protestant Revolution. 
Luther believed in consubstantiation, and what that means is that the, bo- the bread and the juice don't become the body and blood of Christ, but the body and blood of Christ are mixed with them. He used the words in, through, and within. And basically, the best illustration on that is if the bread and the juice are a sponge, then the body and blood of Christ are the water that the sun sponge soaks up. So you still, with consubstantiation, there's the belief that you are eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ. Still a little on the extreme end. Some of you are still going, yeah, I'm still creeped out on that one. Okay, so here's the next one. The next one's called memorialization. And memorialization teaches that nothing happens. That this is just a piece of bread and a little tiny shot glass of juice And all you're doing is remembering Jesus. There's nothing special that happens. It's just a remembrance ceremony. So you kind of have transubstantiation and consubstantiation way over here on one end of the scale. And on the other hand, you have memorialization. There's one that kind of meets in the middle, and it's called real presence. And this is the last belief. Real presence teaches that you eat the bread and you drink the cup, and as you're doing so, nothing physical happens, but something spiritually happens. That you're not physically eating Jesus' flesh, and you're not drinking his blood, but you're spiritually partaking what those meant to us on a spiritual plane. Does that make sense? In other words, we are not literally physically eating his blood and his flesh, we are spiritually taking what his blood and his flesh did for us on the cross. And so, gone through all four of those to basically say none of it matters. You can ignore everything I've said in the last five minutes. It doesn't matter. Not at all. You're welcome. I just wasted five minutes of your day. You're never getting that back. I'm sorry. But here's what does matter. According to 1 Corinthians 11, it doesn't matter what you believe about what happens here. You can be a hardcore transubstantiationist, and your friend next to you can be a total hardcore memorialization person. And none of that matters, because 1 Corinthians 11 states that the only thing that matters is what's going on here and here. In other words, the only thing that matters when we take the Lord's Supper, communion, Eucharist, whatever you want to call it, the only thing that matters is what we're thinking and where our hearts are at with the Lord. That's what matters. That's what's important. And so as we take the Lord's Supper, it's important, according to 1 Corinthians 11, that we examine ourselves. That's the exact wording in 1 Corinthians 11, is that we examine ourselves, that we search our hearts, we search our minds, and we ask God to forgive us, to help us uh, strengthen our relationship with him, and that we thank him for everything he has done in our lives. That's what matters. That's what's important when we take the Lord's Supper. When I was a kid, I would occasionally visit my grandmother's church. It was a Methodist church. And I always thought it was odd uh, when we took communion at this Methodist church. I thought it was this weird ritual where Christians were kind of off in left field and crazy. um, And and I didn't understand it. it. It was totally foreign to me. And then I had a pastor, when I, once I became a believer, I started having a relationship with Jesus. I heard a pastor say, listen, it is a ritual, but if you're only doing this as a ritual without introspection, in other words, without thinking and examining yourself, then this ritual is totally meaningless. Not only that, 1 Corinthians 11 would tell, uh, tells us that not only is it meaningless, but it's also dangerous. That when you're taking the Lord's Supper, there's a special presence of Christ here. And so if you just grab the bread and drink the cup, take the cup, and you go, ah, Christ's body, ha, shoot the cup. Ah, that was the blood. Okay, I'm good. If you don't stop and think about what God has done in your life, what Jesus has done for you, and you're not talking to him about your struggles and your sins, then not only is this meaningless, but it's dangerous. That we need to have a certain reverence about this, that it's not just a ritual. Uh, it's a ritual with meaning and spiritual presence that we need to take seriously. And so we don't usually do this here at Calvary, um, but I'm going to do something a little different. 
And I'm going to just ask that, I'm going to close this off in a little prayer. And during that prayer, I want to guide you in doing some of this examination, this self-examination. Basically, I'm going to open us up, and then I'm just going to guide you. And so just kind of follow my lead. So why don't we all bow our heads and let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. And Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice, for the sacrifice that you made on the cross, the, that your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we could have a new covenant, a new relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that as we remember that this morning, that you would help us to examine our minds and our hearts, that you would help us to not come to you just eating a small piece of bread and a small cup of juice, but that this would be a time where we could personally sit with our Savior and spend time with you. So help us to do that this morning as we take the Lord's Supper. Guys, here's what I want you to do. With your heads bowed, just take a few seconds and ask God to forgive you and to guide you in what you need to do to improve your relationship with him. Take a few seconds and just talk to God about that. Now I want you to take just, again, just a few seconds. And I want you to just spend a few seconds thanking Jesus for who he is and what he's done in your life. Just thanking him. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for delivering us personally from our, the slavery that we were living in in our sin. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to come to this earth and ultimately live a perfect life yet still die on a cross for our sins. And Lord, I pray that as each and every one of us who takes this this morning, I pray that those who take it would spend a moment just thinking about their own lives, that we would think about the ways we need to be forgiven and the ways we need to work on our relationship with you. And Lord, that we would spend some time in thankfulness, thanking you for all you've done and all you are in our lives. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done and how much you love us. And help that be a time of remembrance this morning to spend time with our Savior. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.